All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to the uh, to the broadcast here tonight. This is an episode of uh, Paging Dr. Ram, which is powered by Google+. Plus. Um, this is a hangout session. We're going to have a question and answer tonight with Dr. Jenny Willis. My name is Kyle Tate. I'm actually one of Jenny's graduate students in the biology department over at Colorado State University. Uh, so um, a little bit about a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm interested mainly in uh, primates and and also in in uh, cephalopods and have done some work with with uh, domestic animals as well. Uh, I've been working with Dr. Willis for a few years now, and she's been a been a great resource. And I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk a little bit more about um, about aggression and some some companion animals. And so, uh, without without much further ado, I'll go ahead and and uh, switch over to to Dr. Willis and let her introduce herself. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Jenny Willis and I am uh, an instructor of animal behavior and I also oversee a master's program in zoo, aquarium, and animal shelter management here at CSU. Um, I especially work with companion animals um, and problems that they tend to have that relate to emotional state issues. So things like aggression are on the top of my list um, to be interested in talking to you guys about. In my own life, I have a whole lot of different animals that live at my house, including some humans and some dogs and cats, um, one Shetland pony and some goats and chickens. Um, and so I'm excited to, to entertain your questions at the end uh, to be able to hopefully help you better understand them and live with them in a, in, a, in a better way so that you understand what they might be going through if they're showing some aggression. So to begin, I'm going to kind of go over some of the nuts and bolts of understanding aggression. And so um, it's in my experience, it's really good to kind of think as the animal might. And so I'm going to hopefully help you understand what kinds of different aggression can be occurring in our pet dogs and cats. Um, and so with, with that, uh, we have kind of a, a way to think about it that's um, Two different, two different main types of aggression. So the first main type is predatory aggression. And so cats may show this in play a lot. Um, they may have um, targets that are small mammals that, that might be their even purpose in living in your house. And so um, predatory aggression is quite normal and sometimes people don't term it to be aggression. Um, and it's also quite pleasurable. And so in this picture on the right hand side, you'll see a border collie engaging in a muted form of predatory aggression um, that we know as, as herding drive um, in dogs. And so again, a very pleasurable feeling to have to watch things move, to chase them, um, to you know eventually catch and subdue them. Um, so if we talk about domestic cats, that involves a lot of aspects of their play. If it, we talk about it with domestic dogs, um, sometimes that has to do with some of the uses that we've kind of use them in um, selective purpose for um, what we're what we're what jobs we're trying to accomplish. Um, the other big half of aggression that we're going to focus mainly on tonight is what we call effective aggression. And through some studies that um, were done decades ago, we know how they feel when they engage in that kind of aggression, and they don't feel good. So they don't um, they don't feel in a positive place like they might when they're engaging in predatory aggression. So effective aggression is not fun. Uh, it tends to be avoidance motivated. So like hissing and swatting, if if we're talking about a cat, um, growling, lunging, snapping. You know, if if we're talking about a dog, um, they're all aimed at communicating a message, and the message is usually stop, go away, um, don't come close. And we see the target for effective aggression be typically t people um, or members of their same species. Sometimes you'll see effective aggression um, from dogs to cats and from cats to dogs, um, but that's usually only if they're included in their social group. Um, often we see, unfortunately, um, misplaced predatory aggression um, by dogs towards cats. And I also wanted to bring up the idea of sort of a, um, a basic strategy for approaching changes in life. And so animals can have stable strategies and they can have reactive strategies. And stable strategies tend to encompass um, getting a lot of information about a situation before engaging in a response. And a response would be more of a voluntary choice to make at that moment. Um, a reactive strategy might go on very little information, so something might happen in their environment and they immediately respond to it. 
And, um, and that, that response would be more emotional. And so when we talk about effective aggression, it's really um, talking about that emotional part. So just getting into that prey drive again for just a second, um, with our domestic dogs, we have taken the sequence um, of, of the, the typical prey, prey drive sequence and um, sometimes we've broken it down or isolated only one part of it. Um, so the sequence would naturally be I, which would mean stare at and follow with your eyes, um, a moving target. Um, stalk, which is sort of like the border collie creep um, towards something that they're, you know, they're hurting. Um, you'll see a dog walk very slowly or a cat walk very slowly as they find a target. Um, and so then, um, you know, then, then they might chase it. Um, and then if they're so lucky as to be uh, adept at at catching it, they might do a grab bite and then eventually they, they might do a kill bite. Some breeds have been selected for, um, you know, chasing small rodents, for example, like many terrier breeds. And so their, their prey drive might be completely intact. Um, but some breeds like the Labrador Retriever you see in the picture might have had just one part of the prey drive selected for. So they like to hold things in their mouths that the grab bite has been selected for. And many of the other parts of the prey drive are not as evident in individuals. We always have to consider individuals. So when we talk about particular breed traits, um, we're talking about sort of the purpose of the working part of that breed, but individuals may not show all of those. Um, on the right hand side, you see a border collie, you know, um, that is probably taking a rest from herding those sheep and um, they enjoy herding so much that when you train them to do herding um, the reward is getting to go back to that behavior so there's no food or treats or other play necessary to reward them they just enjoy doing it and so um, they cooperate so they can go back to doing it um, so I want you to remember about predatory aggression is that all aspects of it are pleasurable so both Finding, searching for, chasing, and subduing the prey are all pleasurable. Um, we have to look at the visual system. Um, they're, both cats and dogs are very wired to be able to detect movement, to follow it, um, and to be coordinated enough to get it. Um, where, we, where we look at predatory aggression as a problem is sometimes when there's an inappropriate target. So um, many times um, people might expect that, that small birds and, and mammals um, might be targets for predatory aggression. And so they're not all that surprised if their dog is interested in a squirrel or their cat catches and kills a mouse. Um, and again, like I mentioned, that might even be the goal. Um, however, sometimes we have problem targets or misplaced targets where um, the dog might deem the house cat as the target. That can certainly be a very dangerous problem because it is highly pleasurable to engage in that behavior. So. Um, it's treated very, very differently than how we would treat effective aggression. Effective aggression is essentially everything else. And so while these pictures are all dogs, um, cats have many similar situations. How do they handle strangers? How do they handle being touched and petted by their owners? Um, occasionally we'll have cats that also show resource guarding, although that might be a little bit more of a, a dispositional problem for dogs. Um, and yet, how do we get along with group members? So in, in this picture with the two dogs, um, dogs might not get along in their household. Dogs might not do well seeing other dogs, cats. Um, one of the major reasons that they are given up is, is they can't get along in the household that they were adopted into with the resident cats. So, um, so when we talk about effective aggression, I want you to remember that this animal doesn't feel good. And in fact, when they did brain studies you know, on them, on dogs in particular, and gave them the chance to self-stimulate on that feeling, they did not want to do that. In contrast, when they had the chance to self-stimulate on a feeling like predatory aggression, they would press the lever repeatedly. So very, very different feelings on the inside. Um, so I'm often asked how, um, what might um, have caused this problem in my animal? What things, what factors might be in play? Um, and we do know and have established through different um, research studies that there is a genetic heritability towards um, fearful and um, aggressive temperament. Um, and that means that they inherit sort of a different playing field in their brain with different amounts of some of the chemicals that they might need um, in order to be that stable strategy animal. They may not have enough of some or they might have too much of others and that might lead them to the reactive sort of 
beginning. And then on top of their genetics, we then put what happens to them in their early environment. We call that, um, if, if they are learning about their environment through their mother, um, as most um, domestic dogs and cats do, there's rarely a role for the father in that. So they mo mainly pattern on their mother um, and their maternal behavior. Um, you, the young animal patterns what they expect to find in their environment from how their mother reacts to things. And so in some, again, old older studies where they cross-fostered um, information, or cross-fostered um, individuals between litters, um, you can definitely see that both um, the effect of a stable mother improves reactive, genetically reactive puppies, and, and the effect of a reactive mother makes stably genetic puppies possibly more reactive. Um, we also know there's a lot of stress in weaning. So if weaning or separation from their group happens before six weeks in dogs, um, and even around that same time in cats, um, we know that they are, are adversely affected for their lifetime. Um, so we find that it's a tremendous stressor for an, a, a tremendous disruptor for that young animal um, to be um, suddenly without their group members and without their mom. And so that can lead them to um, kind of being predisposed towards handling stress poorly. Um, we know that if young animals are sick or having to be isolated from others of their their kind early on, like if, if a kitten is, is sick and needs medical treatment, um, or if an, a puppy might have an injury that prohibits them from playing or interacting normally, that we see that sort of sensitive period for development may be affected. Um, so these are all correlated to possible outcomes of aggression um, later on. Um, and then when they can't predict ex with kind of um, consistency um, what may happen, um, where they have experienced a lot of physical punishment in their prior household or their prior experience, um, and they're not sure how to avoid that, that can lead to some proactive strategies with aggression. Um, but I, at, the, at the heart of it, I want you to keep in mind that aggression is a communication. And if we can get at what are they motivated to try to communicate, what are they trying to have happen with their aggression, then we can help um, figure out how to help them feel better. So the motivation of aggression is fear or avoidance. Um, trying to communicate, go away or stop, usually are the main, um, the main messages if we looked at what the communications meaning might be. And they do that through a, dis through a threat display. And so that threat display might include staring. Um, and often with cats, that level of aggression goes completely unnoticed because it's very quiet. Um, it might include hissing or growling, um, barking, lunging, swatting, biting. If we start at the lowest level of communication for that animal and we say, if they communicate and that communication works, they won't escalate that communication typically um, because they don't need to, it worked. Um, and as I tell my children, you know, when my four-year-old is trying to use his words to stay stop, that we need to listen to his words or what will happen. You know, he might actually fall off and walk them, you know, or something like that. So we have to think listening to the communication at the lowest level is what we really wanna do to keep everything the safest. Um, so what happens when that lower level communication doesn't work? Um, then they, um, they escalate up a level. Sometimes when they've had repeated experiences with that, they may start at that higher level because nothing under that level has worked. Um, I also wanna address an issue with labels. Um, so I wanna make sure that we talk in terms of functional definitions of behavior, not just um, words that might um, make us think about those behaviors in maybe an unhelpful way. Um, so this is a, a little graphic from Susan Friedman, who's at U Utah State University, and this is her campaign to help us think about animals in, in more helpful frameworks. Um, and so I think a lot of these words on the screen, angry, dominant, you know, being a bully, being jealous, or being mean, um, would either give that animal a different cognitive state or an attribution that really doesn't make sense, um, or simply just frame the behavior in an unsolvable way. So if they're born dominant, then we can't fix that because it's something that they're born, you know, that that's something that they inherited. And there's always ways to change behavior. So a, a more effective way to think about an animal that's showing aggression is usually that they're threatened. And sometimes that 
doesn't fit right away with how we think about it because um, we feel like, well, they're offensive. They're coming to me to be aggressive, not just if I've invaded their space. Um, and sometimes, again, their history has shown them that they need to do that to be safe. Um, so we have a lot of different types of aggression. Um, they tend to center around access to resources, um, family members, so the canine domestic aggression or aggression you know, with, with cats towards their owners when they're being petted or handled. Um, territorial aggression, this is one that dogs um, tend to, to have more often than cats where they might bark or react to people moving through their area um, and when they're in a confined space, so either a car or a house or a yard. Um, possessive aggression, trying to keep something that they want to keep because they might need to feel better. So food helps them feel better. So they um, want to um, kind of uh, keep a hold of that so they can sort of self-medicate, if you will. Um, redirected aggression is when the target of the, the bite or the aggression isn't the target that kind of raised the level of arousal to begin with. Um, inner dog, inner cat aggression within a household, all of those are fairly complex dynamics um, and they do tend to fall into particular lines of, of um, types of relationships. Um, fear motivated aggression might occur when an animal who is unfamiliar with being handled is attempted to be handled or moved um, or even approached. Um, play or excitatory aggression, this might be when dogs might start off playing and end up fighting. Um, and then finally, the one we see a lot in the veterinary community is pain elicited aggression when we're treating them for something that um, they uh, had happened to them and that we have to help make better. Um, so unhelpful frameworks for thinking about things include, um, you know, not um, thinking that any any animal would never bite. Um, if, if we think about ourselves and we're probably not most of us likely to haul off and hit someone, but if we were sufficiently provoked, we might. And so whenever we're dealing with emotions, it might be that they are sufficiently provoked to escalate their communication to a higher level. Um, we don't want to think of them in terms of them being born that way or that there's nothing we can do to change the behavior. There's always some measurable change that we can have happen so that it's um, likely to, to be different. Um, so um, the one I used to dread when I was starting my career would be you know, the owners who weren't sure how or what was provoking their pet. And so they would say, you know, it just never seems to be over anything. There's no predictive cues and the animal's aggressive. And that if you look in textbooks and published papers, that's very poor prognosis. But I'm happy to tell you that almost always um, there's a number of things that we can probably help isolate that are in fact predictive cues, um, things that might um, provoke them that maybe just with our human paradigm we haven't been able to figure out. The threshold model for reactivity. So below the threshold, I like roller coasters as a model because I don't care for roller coasters very much. So for me, this is a good example um, where you get on the roller coaster and you're starting up the hill and about that point I go, why did I ever let myself get on this roller coaster and how did I get talked into this? And my arousal level and my adrenaline level goes higher and higher and higher until that threshold point where you realize there's nothing you can do to stop it and it's going to happen, at which point you completely panic if you're me. Um, and so the threshold model works well to think about um, animals because the stressors are the things that sort of edge them up that hill, but it's still recoverable. They're still um, underneath that threshold, their higher brain is still in charge of them. And that's the brain, part of the brain that we really want to be in charge of them because that's the rational part, the problem solving part, the part that um, we can appeal to with the things that we've taught them and the things that they know. And beyond that threshold, um, we have to just help keep everyone safe. Um, and there's not a lot of learning that can happen. And unfortunately for treatment of aggression, we often start only working with them at that threshold. And so I'm gonna propose an alternate model. Um, some things to pay attention to um, for your animals as they're getting stressed. Um, the parasympathetic side of the brain is that higher higher brain being in charge and the, the, the rest and digest sort of part of their body. So if they can eat a treat and follow a direction, they're probably in that calm zone. If they can't eat a treat they would otherwise like to eat um, and they can't follow an instruction that they usually would, then they may be ramping up and that's usually um, heading towards that threshold. 
Um, and so we can kind of measure where they are based on how they um, are showing, you know, different signs, dilated pupils, breathing fast, their heart rate increases, um, their body is tense. We see different you know, postural cues um, depending on dogs or cats um, that might indicate you know, that they're getting stressed. And then of course this picture of the golden retriever here clearly is showing aggression, but there were a lot of signs that probably led up to that. Um, when we talk about treating aggression, um, we are trying to assess risk, trying to assess risk and make everyone aware that, that treating aggression um, needs to be a serious thing. And so um, typically we have a lot of dogs that show and a lot of cats that show high frequency, low severity aggression. So they might warn a lot. They might growl, swat, hiss, bite, or biting rarely, but all those things happen much more often. And so then we look at how many different kinds of provoking situations do they, are they provoked by? Um, you know, is it just one or is there a wide variety? And we're kind of seeing a global way of that animal handling new information or new, new situations or novelty. Um, we also look at children. You know, if there are children in the household or if the children are targets, um, we treat that situation very carefully um, because we also we want everyone to stay safe throughout this process and we want to keep animals in their homes if possible. Um, and then rarely um, we might find a situation where a dog um, would be a community threat, maybe occasionally a cat, um, where if they were loose they would go up to and harm another dog, cat, or, or person. And that would be more of a community threat definition. But we don't deal with that very often. Um, and then the rehoming issue, wouldn't they just be better in someone else's house? The answer is very likely no, that their issue would come out in another house unless the issue is directed at a target that wouldn't be present in another home. So um, how do people typically respond to aggressive pets? Um, the typical response of people is, again, at that moment of crossing the threshold when they start to show the growl, the hiss, the swat, our, our response is also emotional. It's typically to punish them for showing it um, or to act aggressively to them. And so here's, you know, a picture of kind of that, um, you know, idea of showing them who the boss is. And what I'd like to remind you again is what are they communicating? So, you know, in this, in this picture, this dog is growling over a food bowl, you know, and they're, the dog is concerned at people approaching the food bowl. And so if we're aggressive to her or try to take her food away, um, we're validating her concern. We're not changing it. And so we need to really focus on helping them change their mind about what they're afraid of, and that will help them be less aggressive. So in order to do that, we have to work below that threshold. We have to think about how can we change their mind about what they're expecting to happen. And there's a phenomenon called cognitive dissonance that I like to kind of keep in mind because they're assuming a person coming to take their food or their bone is going to take it. And if that doesn't happen and something better happens, um, like maybe a person looks at them and tosses chicken to them and walks away, we have had two things happen in that moment as we repeat that over and over again at that level. They are learning that a person appears and instead of feeling scared, they start to feel good and their assumption of what would happen didn't happen. And so those two things together can really help us change their minds. Um, the other thing is that we can't use reinforcement and punishment. So reinforcement and punishment just don't work in this paradigm because it's not a voluntary behavior. So when that dog or that cat is hissing or growling, they're not choosing to do that because they expect a reward. And if we feed them in that moment to help them feel better, they're not going to show it more. They're actually going to show it less, which is the exact opposite. If they were begging at the table and they pawed at you and you fed them, you would see more of the pawing behavior because that's a voluntary behavior. When we have a wholly emotional behavior, we can treat it differently. Um, and so we use techniques to try to change how they feel about the stimulus or the problem and not dealing with the symptom. Um, and so sometimes if you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, I have a pet who anytime, anytime that stimulus is even remotely present, they can't eat and they can't function. 
Um, sometimes we do use medication for anxiety in the treatment of aggression. So you would definitely want to talk to your veterinarian about options like that. Um, hopefully you've kept them in the loop about aggressive behavior in general. Um, but we always think about possibilities to help them get to the point where they can learn. Um, so even if they're kind of falling off that bottom side where they just can't even quite begin to engage in that sort of behavior modification program. It's not impossible, you know, that they can do that. And so I'll put this slide back up at the end um, of ways that you can learn more. Um, so I'm going to try to turn it all back on here. So. Okay, so I think I've I think I've done it. Um. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Willis, for giving us that that excellent introduction to to some of the uh, problems with aggression in, in domestic animals. Just a reminder to our audience that you can participate in this uh, in this dialogue with Dr. Willis and and get your questions answered by. Uh, commenting in the comments section below, um, or by using the hashtag PagingDrRam on social media. Um, so we, we have been getting some questions in, and I think I'll go ahead and, and start seeing what, what Dr. Willis has to say about these. So firstly, um, we got a, a question through Twitter that says, uh, is my dog genetically programmed to be more aggressive than others? He is a Rottweiler. What a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, media hype that might lead us to think that certain dogs are more likely to be aggressive. And if we look at um, research studies and published statistics, we find that um, dogs as individuals bite. Um, particular breeds um, don't necessarily bite more than other particular breeds. Wherever there are um, sort of densities of of popularity for particular breeds, we see more of those um, types of bites in that area. However, um, large dogs, um, sometimes like Rottweilers are listed on the, 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 the do not um, rent to list often, you know, and so there's sort of a de facto ban on some breeds of dogs that are large because large dogs can bite worse when they bite. However, um, it's, it's um, a lot having to do with how they've been raised and how, they, um, in, how individuals have been socialized. So dog bites are an individual problem. And so under socialization, um, you know, rough treatment, um, a number of other factors um, can go into why or how a dog might bite. Um, but the breed alone is not um, something that is very helpful to kind of a lens to look through. Um, so I'm sure that, you know, you know, um, one Rottweiler is not like another, you know, one pit bull is not like another, one um, lab mix is not like another. And so I like to take every individual as an individual and help them with their particular set of problems. Any dog can have the problem of being nervous or afraid of people and, and biting. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that for that uh, explanation. There, we've been we've been getting other questions in, asking about uh, about some some breed specific questions. So I think you already did a great job of sort of addressing that. And I I definitely tend to tend to agree that it's uh, really important to be assessing dogs as individuals when we're looking at these kinds of things, rather than trying to say that they all fit into this box because of their breed. So thank you for for bringing that up. Um, we have another specific question here, and this one's uh, this one's going to be. Um, about Colby. So this is going to be a tabby. So Colby is a three-year-old neutered orange tabby that was adopted about a year ago. Colby was shy at first, but then became a bully. And again, we talked a little bit about uh, some of the terminology and being careful about what we're using in terms of being descript descriptive here. But Colby targets one male cat and one female cat. The target cats are both older than Colby. Um, and the owner had left them outside before he adopted Colby. Both of the target cats had been abandoned and left outdoors to fend for themselves. Um, I know that sometimes the cat who appears to be the aggressor is actually responding to some behavior of the other cat. That doesn't seem to be the case with Colby. Many times I've seen him charge across the room toward a target cat who is just minding his or her own business. Uh, Colby is fine with, other, with her other cats and dogs. Uh, the owner did do some foster care last summer and was very good with, and Colby was very good with the kittens. 
Um, he is aggressive only with the two target cats. Both target cats have recovered from their abandonment and were doing fine until Colby joined the family. And this is from a, from a viewer named Debbie. So if you wouldn't mind addressing Debbie's question for us, that would be great. Sure. No, that's a great question too. And, and certainly brings up a lot of salient points to talk about. So um, first, the idea of sort of um, seniority and shouldn't always older animals be um, kind of viewed as non-targets. Um, unfortunately, in neither cats nor dogs does that seem to be true. So when animals are having conflict, it can certainly be um, the aggressor might be younger, the aggressor might be older. Um, when we see them targeting older animals, um, and when you mentioned something about abandonment, my sense is that maybe they were showing some fearful behavior as well. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned in, in framing your question about um, Colby being sort of a, a shyer cat um, and then turned into this um, more of an aggressor cat, um, I think that really brings to light the flip side of, of fear. So fear can be retreating, fear can be aggressing or asserting themselves in situations that they don't feel comfortable in. Sometimes in group households, um, again, with cats and also sometimes with dogs, is, is that idea that when we have a cat who is really not sure about their environment, but they can control some small piece of it, they'll choose to start with just controlling that one small piece. And so if they can have their behavior affect the behavior of those victim cats and they run away and they leave his presence or they in the future sometimes avoid him altogether, then that makes him feel safer. And so it, it may not have anything to do with what they're doing. It may only have to do with that they are there and that they are, that they are responsive to his threats. Um, so with, with inner cat aggression, um, we look at um, whether the aggressor, um, you know, what, what the behavior of the victim cats is and what the level of threat that the aggressor cat, you know, is doing. And so in this case, it sounds like he's, he's you know, lunging at them or coming at them from across the room and that they probably run away. Um, and that sounds like maybe that de-escalates it at that point. And so his communication worked, say, go away. Um, and so we can work to have them have some relevance for him, um, meaning like right now they show up and he feels kind of anxious and not that comfortable. And so if instead we started pairing their appearance with something more pleasant for him where he only got some special food or some special privilege when he saw them or heard them, um, we also sometimes um, limit the freedoms of aggressors while we're undergoing this process. So they can't intimidate the victims. It's oftentimes when the victim cats don't run, then that sort of frame shifts that for the aggressor and they have to kind of reconsider what they're doing. Um, it also can become a welfare issue for the victims since they are no longer able to do what they would naturally or normally do in your household. So it's, it's a tough problem to give a few minute answer to. Um, however, um, usually what I would do is, is kind of talk about each cat as an individual and figure out how you know, what's important to them, what might be likely things that they need, especially. So all cats need basic things like access to their food bowl, access to their water bowl, access to the litter boxes, if they like attention, you know, access to the owner. Um, and so if they are limited in getting any of those, then all of a sudden their stress level goes up because they now can't get you know, what they need. And so if we're seeing that level of kind of controlling behavior, then we we do um, kind of change management strategies. Um, we kind of talk about like a treatment or a, an idea for, for treating the problem as thinking about managing um, managing the, the cats in the household, changing their routines or what they're allowed to do. Um, what do they need to learn? So what behavior modification could we do to help them all feel differently? Because chances are the victims also feel scared of Colby now. And so, um, and then finally, if, if we don't have a behavioral starting point, you know, working with, you know, your veterinarian, you can find um, some options for relieving the anxiety to the point where everyone can learn in a situation you might be able to create. Um, that one might be um, one to consult someone on um, as far as a behaviorist, um, just to make sure that all those angles get looked at and evaluated. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, we also have another really interesting question here that I'm sure uh, multiple of us have, have dealt with at some point. I've certainly dealt with this one. Uh, so this is, uh, what can we do about a neighbor cat that's spraying around our deck? So that's an interesting problem. I know I've had to deal with it. So uh, I'm interested to see what you have to say about this. Well, I think it's an astute connection that that a spraying cat may also be an anxious cat and it may also um, elicit aggression, um, you know, when the presumably indoor cats are seeing that other cat come around. So it certainly can aggravate a situation. Um, and I've even had situations where um, the two cats in the household got along fine and then we had another cat come in and start, um, you know, displaying outside or spraying the, um, the doorway and then um, the cats inside the house attack each other. And that would be kind of a redirected example of aggression. Um, so it is a problem um, in our in our area in our um, that that we can have um, cats that are free and loose and that we don't we can't control. Um, as we're getting into springtime and summertime, we can have motion activated lights. Um, we can sometimes have motion activated sprinklers to deter that other cat from coming on the property or coming close to the doors. Um, you can also do some things um, to visually obscure um, what your cats can see. Um, certainly they can still smell what may happen, um, but you can also treat the outside of your house. You can blacklight the outside of your house and treat that, um, that scent cue that might be um, being left. <laughs> um, and so you can use um, enzymatic cleaner to break that down so that that cue isn't there for your resident cats. Um, and then you might want to visually obscure their access at times that you're not able to watch. So like at night um, or when you're gone, um, you know, keeping um, curtains closed or keeping access to that area, whether it's outside of a window or outside of a door, um, just so that they're not visually provoked by seeing that that cat doing that. I think that's also a tough situation, but it can be handled, um, especially in nicer weather with some of the motion act um, activated deterrence for that other cat um, to then go away. Well, that's fascinating. I certainly never would have would have thought about it, about approaching that from that from that angle. But that's that's very very cool. So uh, we have another interesting question here. Um, if aggressive behavior is a behavior we don't want, and I feed my dog a treat while they're growling, um, won't, won't won't I just see more growling? So that's a really interesting question. I know I've I've been asked about this a few times as well. So I'd love to love to see what you have to say. Well, thanks, Kyle. Um, so, so I get asked this a lot too, because it, it is really um, a different approach to treating emotional problems in animals than it, it has typically been approached with training. So training, you know, centers around the voluntary behaviors that they do um, and things that they've learned and, and kind of the whole idea is the whole, whole pie is all about reward and punishment. And then it's, you know, when you try and solve an emotional problem, reward and punishment don't work and they don't and then it's like well maybe I just have to be more you know punishing or figure out you know like wait for them to stop growling and then reward them but it's really um, you know ideal if you can consider that um, only half of our behavior that we're talking about then is encompassed you know so if we're talking about emotional behavior that's not responsive to reward and punishment because it's not wholly voluntary. It's it's somewhat um, an unconscious fear-based reaction. So if we can help them feel better and we can kind of trick the brain while we're feeding them, you know, if we can get them to eat, their brain goes, hmm, we're doing digestion. We can't be having a threat at the same time. So they calm down a little bit. And then the next time they might calm down a little bit more with the next treat. And all of a sudden, it's like they blink and all of a sudden they realize, oh yeah, there you are. And I could do this for you. And they kind of come back down enough that then they, um, they're having a good experience, they're not having their ultimate fear realized, and then they can have this new positive association. So feeding them in um, pairing with something scary, a scary stimulus for them, is a whole different type of learning. And it's kind of learning that, that Pavlov engaged in when he was learning about, hey, if I you know ring a bell, um, eventually if I pair feeding them with that bell, they'll start salivating when, I, when they hear that bell. It's that kind of learning. It's the unconscious pairing of associations. And we have that happen in humans all the time. You know, so I don't know how many of us unconsciously push the gas pedal and we see a green light. You know, we, we've 
had this pairing of what to do next, you know, and, and that's that unconscious response that we're really trying to reframe. The good news for us, for our pets, is really that um, they are not processing things the same as adults. So they're not planning for the future and they're not reflecting on the past. They're much more like two or three year old human children. And so they, they're really focused on the now. And so you can some ways can more easily affect their behavior um, through this sort of a change. Um, so if they feel good now and that happens repeatedly, you know, the magic number for repetitions is usually somewhere around 20 at a low level intensity. And then you'd wanna change the, the scenario just a little and practice that association in a slightly harder scenario. But you're always letting them practice that success, that everything was fine, look, I didn't die, you know, assumption challenged and effectively relearned. And so um, if, you're, if you're not sure about this, um, then I always think about ways that you could test it so that you would feel like, yeah, I, I really get it now. Um, you know, a good one to do for a dog who's, you know, reactive at the door is to, you know, have them sit near you, you know, at the door and, you know, knock quietly on the door and then immediately feed them a treat and then just pause like it was all, you know, just wait. And then do it again, knock quietly and feed them really quickly and then wait and watch them change their behavior. So, you know, fourth or fifth time in, they might not bark. They might just look at the door and look quickly to your hand. And so now they've learned this door knock predicts something good is about to happen for me. And that's what we want. Whatever the, the feared thing is, whether it's a person seeing another dog on a leash, you know, we want to try and break that down and pair that with something that feels good to them so that they stop feeling like it's a threat. Thank you so much for addressing that. That definitely is a, is kind of a counterintuitive deal for people to be trying to think about like, oh man, am I reinforcing something that we don't want to have happen? But I think you did a great job of sort of explaining how uh, by pairing something that's that's pleasurable with something that's kind of scary, you can actually you can actually maintain working in that sub threshold, uh, that that desirable sub threshold region that we were talking about in your in your presentation. So thank you for clarifying on that. I think that definitely should make a lot more sense. Um, next, we've got another good question here. Uh, my dog barks like crazy at people when they're walking alone, but is fine in crowds. What might be going on there? Ooh, that's another good one. Um, okay, so uh, so we have to think again about what is the aggression communication good for? So it's a common scenario actually to have um, a dog who reacts poorly to situations that are like one person at a time, like a person coming through a doorway or a person that they might see in the distance on a walk. Um, but that same dog could go and sit in a lobby at the vet hospital or, you know, be walking through a crowd in Old Town and not react to every person. And so that, um, that definitely is um, something that it's just thinking about what the communication is of that um, aggression. So if you think about your best chance to defend yourself or to tell another person to go away, is it more likely your communication is going to be effective if you have just one person to try and affect their behavior, so just one person coming at you? Or if they're all around you, maybe another strategy is better. A lot of dogs choose cooperation in that all around strategy. So they might become very um, deferential and actually cooperate, you know, with a group of, of veterinarians or groomers that are trying to do something with them or to them. Um, and in a crowd, they may just look a little bit shut down. They might be more passive. They might just pant. Um, and they, they might just be um, kind of showing a passive over threshold type behavior. Um, so I think we have to think again about when the aggression is likely to work. Um, and, and so commonly um, in a group situation like that, they, the dog may be fine until someone reaches for them. And then that might trigger them to, to, to give a communication to that one person then who's invading their space in a greater level. That is really interesting because I never would have never really would have put that together that actually the, the, the dog is over threshold in both situations, but is just consciously dealing with this uh, over threshold in, in a different way since uh, since it's got a big group of people. I mean, obviously, you're you're right. I mean, it does. It would totally influence how you how you decide to deal with situations. So, so thanks for clarifying on that. Next, you've got a question here. Um, I have a dog who has been barking at people since she was very small. 
but I can never figure out which people tend to be the problem. Uh, she even barks at a friend who comes over regularly. She gets used to them after a while, but if they leave the room and come back, it starts over. Any ideas about what might be going on there? Yeah, um, so I think um, it sounds like this particular dog is um, both shown kind of an early um, Ex uh, an early symptom showing of that aggression so young might um, kind of lead us to think that that it's kind of been going on for a while. Um, oftentimes dogs will go over threshold um, when they first meet someone um, and that surprise, as they overcome that surprise, then um, they can um, accommodate and develop a relationship with that person when they come down into having their higher brain kind of be in charge of them. And then um, some dogs will kind of remain right around that threshold. So they never really quite relax in that situation. Uh, and so they, they restartle or have, have another subsequent similar response. Um, if that person moves a hand or moves a foot or leaves the room and comes back. Um, and so it just means that behavior modification for them is a little bit more challenging. And sometimes they might be a candidate for working you know, with your veterinarian on some, some anti-anxiety medication just to help make learning a little easier for them. Um, but it's, it's kind of their inability to adjust to that new information. So we kind of bring it back to that reactive strategy um, where everything new is dealt with kind of in the same way. So um, any new person, any new information, it's all dealt with by reacting to a startle. Uh, and so um, it's kind of the black and white model of information. So it's either there or it's not there and there's no richness or gray area there at all to try to figure out. Um, so I would just say, um, you know, to, to start kind of trying to prioritize and think about, you know, what and how many stimuli she reacts to. And if people are the only one, then work with your veterinarian or, you know, a behaviorist and your veterinarian to really make sure that um, you're addressing um, her needs and starting at a level that she can start at. So it's always about the individual. It's always about helping them start and rehearse success. So we would want her to experience a very, very low level of her provoking stimulus, which is a person, you know, and get really good at that before we kind of challenged her to do more. And so when that, um, you know, that that is true, um, it's kind of the go slow to go fast method where we're trying to rehearse success at this seemingly low level. And as they get better at it, learning also changes the brain and neurochemistry in the brain. And so sometimes we might need to use medication to help her start, but sometimes um, if we find a low enough level and we can rehearse it and practice it, then that can kind of snowball effect into getting where we need to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. So uh, we've got another another question here, and this one's probably something a big group of people can relate to here. I, I certainly can with my dog. So my dog hates having her toenails done. Uh, she will bite if I'm not careful. So I just don't do them. Uh, the vet apparently has to be able to sedate this dog in order to touch her feet. Is there anything that the owner could do to, to help kind of mitigate this issue? Yes, and it's something, first I wanted to say, I, I probably should have said earlier on, you know, every every dog who's showing aggression should probably first have a veterinary exam to make sure there's not some physical painful issue. Um, Dogs naturally are, are more nervous about parts of their body that haven't been routinely touched. So, you know, if they were young and, and didn't get a lot of their body parts touched often, um, it can feel strange to them to have, you know, your toenails, you know, because you have to hold their paw and touch their toes kind of hard to be able to get the nail trimming started. Um, and sometimes owners, when they're stressed and nervous and scared, they make mistakes and then there's pain associated with nail trims. So sometimes you can get to that point where they, um, we just really have to start over and reteach the whole behavior. Um, you know, it is at least good that she's sedated at the vet if that's really, if she fights that hard. However, um, oftentimes at home, you can restart um, reteaching how to 
um, do nails and, and just completely back off of the idea that you're going to trim nails today and start investing in the fact that in three weeks we could trim nails. Um, and so, so since it is an ongoing sort of behavioral husbandry behavior that we need to continue doing, um, it's worth the investment um, for her sake. So um, usually you would start by, you know, taking her, her most favorite treats and um, just touching her, her paw and feeding her and waiting, you know, touching her paw and feeding her. Um, not necessarily getting into any restraint, just starting with that level, seeing if, if you can, you can, she'll allow you to touch. And she may initially withdraw her paw and you, you start with sort of safe, you know, um, you know, procedures of, of making sure that you're feeding at the same time that you're touching. Um, as long as she's eating the treat, that's a good sign that you can kind of keep repeating that. Um, but, but again, if you feel concerned at all that, that you can't start at any level without help, um, then definitely seek out that help. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think, I think uh, behavioral husbandry is such a fascinating tool that we've, that we've got in our, uh, in our drawer there when, when dealing with some of these issues and it's kind of almost counterintuitive. It seems like that should just be something that, that, uh, that only the veterinarian or only the behaviorist can do, but, but it's great to, to be reminded that, you know what, there's a lot that we can do um, in terms of behavioral husbandry at home to make these situations less scary when we do present ourselves. So it's really cool to think about kind of counter conditioning at home, uh, making, making the dog a little bit more comfortable so that next time that the toes do get touched, it's not this big, scary, over threshold uh, experience, and it's a lot more easy to, to be worked with. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, also, we've got here, are there any t television or online behaviorists uh, you would recommend or that you would like to warn people to maybe maybe avoid? Okay, yeah. Um, so um, one of my favorite um, colleagues and behaviorists um, passed away recently, but her um, resources are still available. And I think that um, Sophia Yen, Dr. Sophia Yen is a really good um, resource still. And many of her materials are just excellent. Um, I teach using one of her textbooks that has um, an amazing number of videos and um, kind of how to's for doing different veterinary or behavioral husbandry type things. Um, so, so she's definitely um, somebody I think is good. I think in general, principle wise, Victoria Stillwell is also very good. Um, sometimes um, it's not as immediately applicable because it can be kind of complicated, but principally, I think it's good stuff. Um, so she's on TV now. Um, I think that there's um, still some sensationalism around Caesar Milan, and so he's still available as a resource for people to see. And I think in general, um, the principles that he's espousing are, are kind of dangerous to apply at home and, and definitely don't necessarily constitute the best welfare for the animals. And so I would just say, if you've watched that in the past and you've thought this is how you should do things, there's many other ways that are not as confrontational that achieve better outcomes. And so especially with regards to aggression, we want to avoid making our animals scared of us because we want to become their allies in this process. We don't want to become also something to be scared of. So when we're when we're trying to treat this, it's it's kind of commonly thought through many popular books and movies and and, and TV shows that we just need to be you know, stricter and harsher and, and more um, physically forceful with our pets and they'll stop being aggressive. But oftentimes that teaches them to hide it better. So we're not taking away their fear. We're, we're just teaching them to also be afraid of us. So I always think of like, if you're a parent and, and you kind of have a, a, a sense of, of child raising, you think about the times when you've had a child who's been afraid of the dark or a monster in their room. And they don't get less afraid if you yell at them for being afraid. They just get also afraid of you and afraid of telling you about stuff. And so we don't want to teach our pets avoidance. Um, especially not avoidance of us if they're feeling scared. We would like to have their communications be honest communications so that if they growl, we know if we you know, help them feel better, help them get out of that situation, um, that they're going to not escalate upwards. Um, unfortunately, sometimes a lot of the more popularized dominance-based methods can lead us to treat them with more physical punishment, which might 
cause them to then hide that communication until the bite. And we don't want them to bite from with no warning. That's far more dangerous and difficult to treat at that point. So just kind of think about um, being their ally in the situation. Um, and, and there are, you know, situations that um, aren't safe to work with. Um, but the majority of pet issues um, are fairly, like I said, high frequency, low severity. And there's often a host of, of warning signs that come before the actual aggression that really, if we work at that level, that's so much safer and that helps them feel better. And then we never get to this level. If we only wait for them to show this level of aggression and then we say, don't show that, it doesn't help them feel better. And so we have to just kind of think of it in those terms. Great, yeah, thank you so much for, for pointing that out. I think it's a really important thing for, for dog owners to be aware of that actually, you know, dogs are really, really excellent at giving us all kinds of behavioral evidence uh, that, that they're, you know, hey, I'm kind of uncomfortable, kind of starting to approach that that threshold. And it's really cool that, that if, if you know what to be looking for, uh, you can you can kind of get out ahead of that and make sure that, that things don't progress too far to the point where it can get dangerous even. So that's really, really great information to have. We're going to go ahead and end with this last question here. Um, but this is one that I'm sure, once again, is going to resonate with, with many of the listeners here tonight. So um, we've got someone asking, why is my dog aggressive? What's what's going on here? I, I spent the first year socializing him to every everyone everything and everyone I could think of, and he's still reactive. Could I have prevented this? Well, thanks for asking that question, because I think that um, owners of aggressive pets are tend to made to feel very responsible for creating the problem. And I don't necessarily think that in most cases that is true at all. I think that um, the scene was set possibly before even adopting that pet, and that oftentimes as they mature, um, things that, that scared them as puppies and young kittens might you know, show with aggression more later in life. Um, for kittens, we know that by eight weeks, they might show adult levels of aggression. Um, but for dogs, it can often be when they socially mature from one to three years of age. Um, cats can also have kind of that second change as well um, later on after they become adults. So it can be sort of a problem that if you didn't notice them avoiding, and they can be very good and passive at avoiding problems. So it may not have been wildly evident, you know, as a younger animal that, that they were nervous about those things. They might have just panted. Their eyes might have dilated. They might have had some more passive stress signs. Um, but I don't think that there's a lot of good to go looking for in blame. Um, if you socialized your dog and they, um, you know, you tried to experience all those different things, the definition of socialization is just to experience a stimuli or, or stimulus before it becomes um, something they're afraid of. So when they're just kind of young and their, their minds are kind of being molded um, before they're afraid, if they experience something, then they have more they have more diversity of things that they've had happen to them. They're more likely to handle new things better. That's what socialization is for. If you have a puppy or a kitten who's already afraid of all those things, then we treat them kind of in that um, that more remedial category where we we already need to teach them not to be afraid of it. That's not quite socialization, and so sometimes um, it can be that situation where a very fearful young puppy. Who might submissively urinate when somebody reaches for him as an adult might show aggression towards that person reaching towards them. Um, however, it, it, the warning signs are not necessarily obvious and they're not 100% predictive. No puppy temperament test has been able to really successfully predict adult temperament. And so it's nature and nurture. And so you can do a lot to, to try to help give them all those experiences. But at the end of the day, um, when they've grown up, they still are kind of their product of their genetics plus their environment. And they're, they may have had a reactive parent. They may have had a parent who was nutritionally stressed during pregnancy. They might have been you know, taken away from their litter too young. There's all of these things that might have predisposed them towards you know, a more aggressive, high stress model. So I think you know, don't necessarily look as much on what could you have done differently. I would say, what could you do now? Um, because it's almost, always true that we can achieve really, really good outcomes if we focus on what are they showing us that they're afraid of, how can we help them feel differently, and doing that in a safe, humane, and effective manner. So thanks for asking your question. 
Well, and thanks for answering it. We certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to help us address some of these really important questions that uh, that, that I'm sure hit home with, with just tons and tons of people. So uh, just thank you so much for your time tonight, Dr. Willis, and thank you very much to all of our viewers and listeners tonight. Uh, just as a reminder for you all, this, this video is going to be posted on Colorado State University's YouTube page, and it will also be available on the VTH uh, Veterinary Teaching Hospital's website. So thank you very much, and uh, have a great rest of your night.